So, we are in the book of Job, and uh, we will try to cover chapters 6 through 8 tonight, so hold on tight. Here we go. Well, can he do three chapters? I don't know. I do not know, but I will try. I will attempt. Job chapter 6. As we've talked about, Job is going through the worst time anyone could ever imagine. He's lost all his possessions. His children have died, and his health has failed. And what makes this even more confusing is that Job is a good guy. He is a good guy. God has decided to allow Job to go through this difficulty, not because he's mad at him, but because he's proud of him. God wants to show the world, the universe, what a godly man will do when he goes through a difficult time. That's stated in the first two chapters. We don't have to wonder about that. You're going to hear all kinds of garbage just confusing the heck out of you from Job and his friends. But don't miss the fact that God's already told us what's going on here. There's a couple things to keep in mind as we study the book of Job. This is really important. This helps you to keep, keep from getting confused. First is that sometimes Job is wrong. So don't take everything he says as, well, that, that, he's speaking truth. This is the Bible. No, he's a hurting man. So keep that in mind. And sometimes Job's friends are wrong. In fact, 90% of the time they're wrong in a way. They're going to say things that are true. They're going to say some things that are even quoted by other writers in the scriptures because there's truth to what they say. The problem is it just doesn't apply to Job. And if you get these things straight, then it will help you get through this book. Be careful about building doctrine on the things that Job or his friends say. You have to be careful about that. You, you need to understand that um, this is simply giving us an idea how people respond to difficulty. And I don't know whether you've ever gone through a horribly difficult time. Some of you have. Some of you are going through it right now. But this book, if you have, this book is going to sound oh too close for comfort. That's because this is how we struggle with these things. So we pick up the story with Job's response to one of his friends. They're going to go back and forth and arguing over these things. The last one to speak was Eliphaz, which we have guessed is the oldest of his group of friends. So chapter 6, verse 1. Then Job answered and said, Oh, that my grief were fully weighed and my calamity laid with it on the scales, for then it would be heavier than the sand of the sea. Therefore, my words have been rash. Now, it kind of sounds as if he's a little bit sorry for all the complaining that he's done back in chapter 3, and I think that that's possible. The point is that something has happened to him that's made him extremely sad. It's weighing on him. It's heavy on him, and that's why he's saying all this stuff. The problem is he's, his friends are responding to what he's saying instead of responding to the fact that he's hurting. For the arrows, he says, for the arrows of the Almighty are within me. My spirit drinks their poison. The terrors of God are arrayed against me. Now, when he says the arrow, arrows of God are inside me, here's an example of where he's wrong. Because God's not the one fire, fighting the arrows. It's, it's been Satan that's been firing the arrows. So this is, again, the kind of thing where you have to kind of pick and be careful how you take all this stuff. He says, does the wild donkey bray when it has grass, or does the ox low over its fodder? He's just saying, look, I'm like a hungry animal. It's, it's, okay. it's natural that I'm making noise, okay? Can flavorless food be eaten without salt, or is there any taste in the white of an egg? My soul refuses to touch them. They are loathsome food to me. Now, can, can flavorless food be eaten without salt? Um, he's so sick that he's lost his appetite. Now, I can tell you, these, there's two things in here that I'm quite familiar with. Because now that I have had my heart attack and I am learning to eat like the doctor has recommended to me, Vladimir, I'm being very good on my diet. I really am. I want you to know. He's, he's one of, he was one of my nurses in the hospital. Um, so just for Job's sake, I was, reading, I was reading about this on my walk this morning, and so I was remembering, I was thinking, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I wanted to try cooking some egg whites. Just, I've never tasted just egg whites, so I cooked just, this isn't my, my pan of egg whites, I, I, but I found this on the Internet. 
so it's true. Um, I, I scramble a couple of egg, egg whites, and I tried them. And you know what they taste like? Not like nothing. There's no taste to them. No, nothing. Zip. Zilcho. I have also learned that I have to reduce my salt content in my diet. So like, basically no salt. Nothing. You've got to cut salt out of everything. You've got to go low sodium on everything. I have this incredibly impossible restriction of salt on my diet because that, that keeps your blood pressure down. So people like me might complain about tasteless food, but i got news for you. Job's life is way, way worse than being on my diet. I'll be on my diet any day compared to what Job's gone through. He's kind of lost his appetite. Verse, chapter 6, verse 8 Oh, that I might have my request, that God would grant me the thing that I long for, that it would please God to crush me, that he would loose his hand and cut me off. He just wishes God would let loose and kill him. That's what he's wishing for. And keep in mind here, Job does not take his own life. As depressed and distraught and as horrible as life is for him, he doesn't take his own life. That's important. He says, verse 10, then I would still have comfort. If, I, if God killed me, then I would still have comfort. Though in anguish I would exult, he will not spare, for I have not concealed the words of the Holy One. New Living Translation here in verse 10 says, at least, I like this better, better translation, at least I can take comfort in this, despite the pain, I have not denied the words of the Holy One. Um, at, at least I hasn't cursed God, and he's not going to curse God through, through this thing. He's going to say, well, have, have his fill of complaints, but he's not going to curse God. Verse 11, what strength do I have that I, should ha that I should hope, and what is my end that I should prolong my life? Is my strength the strength of stones, or is my flesh bronze? Is my help not within me, and is success driven from me? Now, when he talks about the strength of the stones, he's, he's saying, look, I'm not... Superman, you know, I'm not the Hulk. I can't take all of this. That's the point. Verse 14. To him who is afflicted, kindness should be shown by his friend, even though he forsakes the fear of the Almighty. You know, if, if somebody's going through a rough time, even if they do turn their back on God, if you're, if you're their friend... He says you should show kindness. And the lesson is about grace to others. The word that's translated kindness, it's the Hebrew word chesed, which, it, which can be translated goodness, kindness, faithfulness. This is the equivalent to the New Testament word for grace. To the, to the afflicted, grace should be shown. Ephesians 4.32 says, and be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. The word that's translated forgiving in Ephesians 4.32, it's the Greek word charizomai, which is the verb form for grace. We ought to be gracing. Now, yes, you can translate it as, as forgiving, because forgiveness is a part of grace. Grace is giving somebody something they, did, they don't deserve. Forgiveness can be part of that, sure. So that's why they're translating it forgive. But it's just doing good things for other people, gracing one another. Um, that's how we ought to be treating those who are afflicted. It says, even if they forsake God. Verse 15. My brothers have dealt deceitfully like a brook, like the streams of the brook that pass by. In Israel... There's these gullies all over the place, and they are known uh, by the locals as wadis. We call them gullies, but they're, they're, they call them wadis. And most of the year, there's like little gullies, little canyons that run through the hills. And, and most of the year, 99% of the time, they're dry, no water, nada, zilch, zippo. But when it rains, then they'll fill up with water. But then... Within a day or two, they're gone again. It's all dry. It's not even like the Fullerton Creek. I can walk by the Fullerton Creek. There's almost water there every day, you know, even though it's basically a big drainage thing, you know, but it's because everybody runs their sprinklers and then water all runs in and stuff like that. In Israel, the gullies, the wadis, it's, it's only when it rains, and then when it rains, boom, they're gone. Job's friends came to supposedly comfort him, 
but they're of no help at all. They're like a person looking for water and trying to look where the riverbed is, but it's dry. Verse 16, which are dark because of the ice, these wadis, and into which the snow vanishes when it is warm. They cease to flow when it is hot. They vanish from their place. So even the wadis might even fill with ice and snow in the wintertime because there are places in Israel that, s- that snow up in the higher elevations, but as soon as it's warm, it's gone. It's gone. The paths of their way turn aside. They go nowhere and perish. The caravans of Tima look. The travelers of Sheba hope for them. The, it's a picture of foreign travelers heading through Israel, going through the desert, and they're trying to look for water. So what do you do? You go down to the gullies, you go down in the riverbeds, but there's nothing there. That's what Job's friends have been like. You know, Job's looking for comfort from them, but there's nothing there. Verse 20, they are disappointed because they were confident. They come there and are confused. For now you are nothing. You see terror and are afraid. This is interesting. You see terror and are afraid. I'm calling this fear of the unknown. And I have a video. Are we ready for the video? Okay. Dear Kitten, after the big game starts, your first instinct will be to find a quiet place to escape the madness. I need to warn you, though, don't go into the bedroom looking for a place to hide. It's horrifying. There's a pile of coats in there, and the people who are wearing them are gone evaporated. I dug down all the way to the bottom of those coats once, and there was no sign of life. The only thing that's left is the smell of their armpits, and the coats, which I just mentioned. I think it's what happens to the losers of the big game. They destroy them with some kind of a ray gun, which I cannot find. Good question, kitten. What were they doing lying in a giant pile on the bed before they were evaporated? I don't know. Listen, someday I'm going to be gone, and you're going to have to figure all this out for yourself. I'm like a Sherpa. Sherpa to the knowledge. And these coats, obviously, are a sign that there was a giant catastrophe here. No pun intended, because we had nothing to do with it. I don't think. Really, I tell you that there's a room full of evaporated people, and it's the doorbell that scares you. It's a freaking bell. What do you imagine is going to happen? Anyway, like I was saying, don't go into the bedroom. I don't want to go in there and find just a little pile of your fur and nothing else. I have grown fond of you. Oh, that was hard to say. That was... Is it weird I feel like hissing at you right now? So sometimes we're like those cats, and we're just afraid of everything that we don't understand. Sometimes that's why we react so poorly to people, because... We're afraid. We might be afraid that what has happened to them might happen to us. I've seen that. I've gotten kind of some strange reactions after my heart attack, to tell you the truth. I think people are afraid of not, not knowing what to say, or, or am I going to go away, or am I going to die on you, or something like that. I'm just, I'm just being honest. I've had some weird, weird reactions. Um, we might be afraid that we don't understand what's happening, so I don't, know how to, I don't know how to respond to this. I don't understand this. We might be afraid that we don't know how to minister to them, so I don't do anything. Fear of the unknown. He says, he says to his friend, you just, you're no good at all. You see terror, that's Job, and you're afraid. That's why they're acting so poorly, he says. I think that's kind of insightful, don't you? I, I think that's pretty insightful. Verse 22, did I ever say, bring something to me or offer a bribe for me from your wealth or deliver me from my enemy's hand or redeem me from the hand of oppressors? See, Job hasn't, uh, Job hasn't asked for their help. He hasn't asked them to pay his overdue mortgage. He hasn't asked them to bring magic healing powers to stop the boils that are all over him. He hasn't asked for anything. Um, they just don't know how to respond. He says in verse 24, teach me and I will hold my tongue. Cause me to understand wherein I have erred. I think he's sincere in asking these guys, if he's done something wrong, show me. But so far they haven't been hitting the mark. They've, they're, and they're going to come up with a ton of stuff over the next couple of weeks. All kinds of stuff of, that they, well, maybe you did this. Or maybe you did this. 
Or maybe it didn't strike one, strike two, strike three. You're out. They're just, they, they just don't get any. They don't, they don't get it. How forceful are right words. But what does your arguing prove? How forceful are right words. New Living Translation. Honest words can be painful. But what do your criticisms amount to? And there's a lesson here. Friends do say tough things. See, the point of the book of Job is not that good friends shut up. That's not the point. The point of the book of Job is not, well, friends, good friends only say nice, comforting things. Oh, there, there, everything will be okay kind of stuff. No, that's not the point. Um, true friends will speak up when they see something wrong. Proverbs 27, 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. The problem has been, they've said, they're saying plenty of rough things. The problem is, is it's just none of, it's the, none of it fits. It doesn't fit Job. They're thinking that he's done something, and he hasn't. Verse 26, Do you intend to rebuke my words and the speeches of a desperate one which are as, win as wind? Um, the lesson I want to talk about here is this. Handle desperation carefully. I think we can all fall into the trap of thinking we need to respond to a person's words when all they need to do is talk and spill their guts. Don't necessarily have to correct everything they say or necessarily have an answer for it all. Though if you do, maybe it's appropriate to speak up. We need to learn empathy. I found a gem on, on uh, this morning. So what is empathy, and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's, a, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions, where empathy is relevant, and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, you know, I'm down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, Empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time, because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Isn't that good? Sad thing is that Job's friends don't show empathy or sympathy, just condemnation. They do the judgment thing. So handle desperation 
carefully. I pray that we would learn empathy. Verse 27. Yes, you overwhelm the fatherless and you undermine your friend. Now, therefore, be pleased to look at me, for I would never lie to your face. He's saying, if you just look at me in the face, you could tell, I'm not lying to you. You know, I'm telling you the truth. Verse 29, yield now, let there be no injustice. Yes, concede my righteousness still stands. Is there any injustice on my tongue? Cannot my taste discern the unsavory? In other words, you're trying to accuse me of all these bad things, but they haven't found anything, nothing you've said rings true. Verse 1, chapter 7. Is there not a time of hard service for man on the earth? Are not his days also like the days of a hired man? To be honest, everyone goes through hard times. I think that's kind of what he's saying. Look, everybody goes through hard times. Verse 2, like a servant who earnestly, and let me just stop there for a second. Everyone goes through hard times. See, that's one of the reasons why we get all superstitious about the book of Job. And we read it and go, oh no, it's ruining my life. I'm reading the book of Job. Oh, my life is horrible. No, you're just going through hard times like everybody goes through hard times. The book of Job is making you think about your hard times and making you ask the same questions that Job is asking. We all go through hard times. And yes, some people go through harder times than others. But we all go through hard times. So verse 2, like a servant who earnestly desires the shade and like a hired man who eagerly looks for his wages, so I have been allotted months of futility and wearisome nights have been appointed to me. When I lie down, I say, when shall I arise and the night be ended? For I have had my fill of tossing till dawn. He's getting, having a hard time sleeping at night. And you know what that's like when it's, when it's in the middle of night and you, and you wake up and you can't go back to sleep and it's only... 2 a.m. in the morning, and you lay down, and you close your eyes, and you try, and you look at the clock again, and it's 2.05 in the morning, and, and, and maybe you're hurting, maybe you're in pain, and, and you look at the clock, and it's 2.06 in the morning, you know, and you're thinking, when is this night going to be over? That's what he's feeling. Verse 5, my flesh is caked with worms and dust. My skin is cracked and breaks out afresh. I don't have a picture. I just want you to know that. I just want you to know that. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. You know, when you're really sick, the daytime is much better than the nighttime. You know, it is. You just long for the night to be over. But he says, like, when the daytime comes, it just goes like this. And then I'm back at night again. It just, it's just horrible. Verse 7. We think that this last part of the chapter is addressed to God as a prayer. Some people don't think the prayer starts until verse 17 or so, but I think that as you go through it, you'll see pretty soon that I think it starts here. Verse 7. Oh, remember. So I think he's turning his eyes to God right now, and he's speaking to God. Oh, remember that my life is a breath. My eye will never see, uh, never again see good. The eye of him who sees me will see me no more while your eyes are upon me. I shall no longer be. As the cloud disappears and vanishes away, so he who goes down to the grave does not come up. He shall never return to his house, nor shall his place know him any more. Therefore, I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. So Job feels that he must complain because God's probably not going to hear me once I'm dead. This is his concept of death. And remember, keep in mind, his ideas about death are not accurate. This is just a, this is just a, a, a man in his, in, his, in his depression. Verse 12, am I a sea or a sea serpent that you guard over me when I say, my bed will comfort me. My couch will ease my complaint. Then you scare me with dreams and terrify me with vision so that my soul chooses strangling and death rather than my body. Yeah, he says, so he says, you scare me with dreams in verse 14. So the idea is that when he thinks he can escape this tragedy by going to sleep, then, then he just gets nightmares. So there's no escape. Watch closely. 
and listen to the sound of my voice. No, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. I loathe my life. I would not live forever. Let me alone, for my days are but a breath. What is man that you should exalt him, that you should set your heart on him, that you should visit him every morning and test him every moment? What is man? Does that sound familiar? What is man that you should exalt him? David uses the same thought. I don't know if exactly if he's quoting Job, but he, it sounds very close. And David takes him in a different direction. Psalm 8. David says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. So David takes the idea of God thinking of us, and, and it makes him think of God's grace. As in, like, why would you, when you think of, when you're, when you're mindful of us, why would you be so good to us? That's how David takes that idea of God watching you every minute. Why, why would you be so good to us? Job takes the idea of, why would, would you stop thinking of me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid that every time you think of me, my life gets worse. So just stop already. Stop thinking of me. It's interesting. It's hilarious. But you know what? That's, that's where we go when we're depressed, right? That's where we go when we're depressed. You know, we shouldn't be afraid of God thinking of us. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him freely for us. How will he not freely give us all things? Who is he condemned? Oh, Christ is he who justifies. You don't need to be afraid of God. You want him thinking of you. You do. Verse 19. How long will you not look away from me and let me alone till I swallow my saliva? I don't even have a chance to just swallow my spit. Have I sinned? What have I done to you, O watcher of men? Why have you set me as your target so that I'm a burden to myself? He says, what have I done to you? Job admits he's a sinner, but he doesn't understand what he's done specifically to deserve his troubles. He is thinking exactly like his friends, just like his friends. He thinks he's done something to deserve this. And in truth, his troubles have nothing to do with him doing something bad. We've already talked about this, and we will talk about this over and over again so that we get this. God is proud of Job. And God is allowing him to go through this because he wants the universe, he wants Satan to see what a man does who trusts him when he goes through difficult times. That's what he's doing. And that might be some of what you're going through. Could be. Because oh my, how he is proud of you. I don't wish we'd, you could be a little less proud maybe, but no. <laughs> oh, he's, he's thinking just like his friends. Verse 21. Why then do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? For now I will lie down in the dust, and you will seek me diligently, but I will no longer be. He's afraid that if God doesn't respond to his questions soon, it's going to be too late because he'll be dead, and he's not going to be able to hear. There's a little lesson I want to talk about just with this, this, this uh, last part of the chapter. And I'm, I'm calling it talking to God. You're going to notice that Job's friends, and I use that term loosely, Job's friends talk a lot about God. Job seems to be the only one who is talking to God. And when God eventually speaks up, because he will, at, at some point God will say, this is stupid, enough is enough, and God speaks up. But who does God speak to when he speaks up? He speaks to Job not to his friends, not to the people who just talk about him, but to the man who is talking to him. To be a good friend, to be a good friend, not to spend as much time talking to God about the person we're concerned about as we are talking about God. Pray for the person. And even more important, friends, pray with it is so easy to give advice, to, to quote scriptures, than to actually grab a hand and pray with them. 
James gave us some ideas about how to minister to those who are sick. James 5.13, he says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Talking to God. Verse 1 of chapter 8. We meet Bildad. This is his first time to speak. Then Bildad the Shuhite answered and said. Now, there is a disagreement among Bible scholars over who the shortest person in the Bible was. Some people say it was Zacchaeus because he's the one who was so short he had to climb a tree, right? Right? That's Luke chapter 19. Others people think it was Nehemiah, <laughs> Nehemiah, right? Right? But I'm pretty sure it was Bildad because he was just shoe height. <laughs> but, wait. but wait, there's more. <laughs> Later on, I got one more really groaner, I'll tell you. <laughs> so, Bildad the shoe height answered and said, Now, I, you know what, let me just say this. I took this out of my notes, but I want to put it back in. We think that they're going in order of oldest to the youngest. And that's even kind of verified when you get to Elihu, who's the fourth guy who's not even mentioned until the end. And he says, I'm the youngest. I've been keeping my, I've been keeping my mouth shut to you, old windbags, finished. So we think that they're going from oldest to the youngest. Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar. And you're going to notice that as these men speak, the younger they get, the harsher they are. The younger they get, the harsher they are. You know, when I was 30 years younger, I knew all the answers. I knew all the answers. And people would come to, I remember, I remember 30 years ago, 40 years ago, I remember being, you know, a young Christian in high school. And I had a group of friends, me and my, my best friend, we had a bunch of people that we hung around with. And we were their counselor, we were the counselors. We, these people would come to us with their problems because they had a lot of problems. And we had a lot of answers. We did because we, we knew the Bible. We knew our 25 verses that solved everybody's problems. And we solved everybody's problems. Along with knowing that you, thinking that you know it all comes condemnation. Well, why, aren't you, why are you such a jerk in doing this in the first place, you know? You know what? Why are you messing your life up? But it seems to me, the older I get, I hope, the more gracious I get. Peter says, grow in the grace of the Lord Jesus. I think there's something there. As you are growing in the Lord, you need to be growing in grace, being merciful to people. Maybe you don't have all the answers to be compassionate. There's something kind of buried with this Bildad and then you see the progression, growing in grace. Verse two, so Bildad speaks up. How long will you speak these things and the words of your mouth be like a strong wind? You just a bunch of hot air, buddy. Does God subvert judgment or does the Almighty pervert justice? See, he's, he's accusing Job He's saying that Job is accusing God of being unfair. And you know what? He is. And he's not done. He's going to get worse. He's going to be saying, this just is no fair. I can't speak up. I can't do nothing. You're just, you just keep crushing me, you know. But when you're responding to someone struggling with this, you need to let them vent. That's part of that empathy thing. You don't always need, you don't always need to defend God. We get all upset with some of the, the idiotic things that we say to each other. Sometimes you just got to let them blow the, blow the steam off. Look, God is fair. And um, there is truth to that. God is fair. When the serpent tempted the woman in the Garden of Eden, he did it by challenging God's justice, God's fairness, hinting that God was holding back from them. In Genesis 3, verse 4, then the serpent said to the woman, you, shall, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. 
when you are talking with the serpent, God is going to seem unfair. When you are talking with the serpent, God's going to seem unfair. And if God seems unfair to you, who have you been talking to? That's what gets us into trouble. And talking about unfair, there was a group of monks, that were friars, that were getting a reputation for being unfair. So the friars were behind on their belfry payments, and they opened up a small florist shop to raise funds. And everyone liked to buy the flowers from these men of God, and the rival florist nearby thought the competition was unfair. He asked the good brothers to close down, but they would not. He went back and he begged the friars to close. They ignored him. He had his mother go and plead with the friars to get out of the business. They ignore her too. So the rival florist hired Hugh McTaggart, the roughest, most vicious thug in town, to persuade them to close. Hugh beat up the friars and trashed their stores, saying he'd be back if they didn't close the shop permanently. Terrified, they did so, and they proved that Hugh, and only Hugh, can prevent florist friars <laughs> Hugh and only Hugh can prevent florist friars <laughs> sorry I just I've been waiting for that one all day <laughs> okay when Adam when A Adam when Abraham found out that God was planning on destroying Sodom and Gomorrah because of their great wickedness he knew he had a problem Abraham's nephew, Lot, was living in Sodom, and Abraham decided to have a discussion with God about this judgment. You want to write, want to write this verse down. There's a great principle about this. Part of Abraham's discussion with God in Genesis 18, 25, Abraham, Abraham says to God, far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked, far be it from you, and here's the principle, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the answer to that question is, of course. He's the judge of the whole world, and, and, and is he not going to do what's right? Do you think God's not going to do what's right? God's going to do what's right. God's going to do what's right. And God would destroy Sodom because of their wickedness, but before he did, he removed uh, his nephew, the nephew Lot, got him out of the way so that he didn't destroy the righteous with the wicked. God does what's right. God is very, very fair. Verse 4. If your sons have sinned against him, he has cast them away for their transgression. Now you remember, part of Job's calamity is that his kids have all died, sons and his daughters. So Bildad, being the kind, compassionate, sensitive man that he is, Suggesting the kid, the Job's kids are dead because they had it coming to them. Don't do this, by the way. Don't do this. Don't do this. Verse 5. If you would earnestly seek God and make your supplication to the Almighty, if you were pure and upright, surely now he would awake for you and prosper your rightful dwelling place. He's hinting that God's probably not answering Job because he must be asleep. And if Job was such a good guy, his call to God would wake him up. And, uh, and God would then certainly you know, help him out. But the problem is, with Bildad's idea, is that God doesn't sleep. But Psalm 121, he who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. He's wrong about God being asleep. Verse 7, though your beginning was small, yet your latter end would increase abundantly. Verse 8. For inquire, please, of the former age, and consider the things discovered by their fathers. For we were born yesterday and know nothing, because our days on earth are a shadow. Will they not teach you and tell you and utter words from their heart? He says, inquire, please, of the former age. He's asking Job to ask the older, the guys that are even older, who ha as an authority, we've talked about when the book of Job fits historically. 
And we, we believe that Job could be a contemporary of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, we talked about that at the beginning of the book. And if you look at Genesis 11, you will find that Abraham was born, you can, you can track this on your own, he was born about 292 years after the flood of Noah. Noah's son, Shem, one of the three sons that went through the flood with their wives, Shem lived for 500 years after the flood. So if Job is a contemporary of these fellows, there might be a chance that Shem is still alive. A man who survived the flood of Noah. Does that blow your mind? It blows my mind. We often don't make those connections. Maybe, maybe Bildad's suggesting he should go check with Shem. Shem understands God's judgment, you know, and all that kind of stuff. That's, I don't know, that just... I find this interesting. Verse 11. Can the papyrus grow up without a marsh? Can the reeds flourish without water? While it is yet green and not cut down, it withers before any other plant. So are the paths of all who forget God, and the hope of the hypocrite shall perish. A papyrus reed doesn't last very long without water. And since Job is obviously a man who has forgotten God, it's like he's a papyrus reed cut off from the water, and so he's not going to last very long. He's going to dry up. Verse 14, um, these hypocrites, whose confidence shall be cut off and whose trust is a spider's web. He leans on his house, but it does not stand. <coughs> <coughs> he holds it fast, but it does not endure. This uh, hypocrite, whose trust is a spider's web. He's counting on something that's as strong as a spider's web. Um, and it would seem, in verse 15, it says he leans on his house. So it seems like Bildad, Bildad thought that Job was trusting his own house, perhaps his family. But it was as secure as trusting in a spider's web because they're, they're all dead. Verse 16, he grows green in the sun. And you know what? It's kind of the, the New King James is a bit confusing here. So let, we're going to read the next couple verses in the message because I like the way he puts it all together. So verse 16. Or they're like weeds springing up in the sunshine, invading the garden, spreading everywhere, overtaking the flowers, getting a foothold even in the rocks. But when the gardener rips them out by the roots, the garden doesn't miss them one bit. The sooner the godless are gone, the better, then good plants can grow in their place. Now he's, all hint he's hinting that this is all Job. And so God's going to just rip him out from the, from the roots, and he's just going to dry up. Verse 20. Behold, God will not cast away the blameless, nor will he uphold the evildoers. So Bildad is implying that Job is not blameless, because look what's happened to you. God doesn't cast away the blameless people. God doesn't let... Blameless people go through what you're going through. And yet, if you remember back in Job chapter 1, verse 8, God's already declared Job blameless. Exact same word. Exact same word. Verse 21. He will yet fill your mouth with laughing. This is if you repent, if you turn around. He will yet fill your mouth with laughing and your lips with rejoicing. Those who hate you will be clothed with shame and the dwelling place of the wicked will come to nothing. Um, so Bildad is implying that if Job would just repent, then everyone who is currently enjoying your trouble will be embarrassed because you'll be restored. That's kind of the, the gist of it. Okay, one last lesson, and then we'll, then we'll be done. I'm calling it the proper use of truth. Eliphaz and Bildad have some wonderful doctrines down pat. They have a lot of things that are correct in their theology. You know, this idea about, about um, God will not cast away the blameless. Well, there's truth to that. There's absolute truth to that. 
They have notches in their Bible for all the times they've corrected other people's bad doctrines. You know, they carry around their Bibles, and every time they fix you, you know, put another notch in their Bible, you know. Instead of bringing healing from God's word, they're hurting others. Paul wrote, Paul wrote 2 Timothy chapter 2, And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. God's servant, you and I, we ought to be able to teach people. We ought to be able to correct them, but to do it in gentleness, to do it in humility, for the goal of getting people to escape the snare of Satan. And even if Job had some secret sin that he really was hiding, Paul writes, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. I don't know about you, but I don't see a lot of gentleness in the things that these fellows are saying. Um, they've got their guns out and they're blazing. We talked on Sunday about how God's word is like a weapon. It's like a sword. It's a weapon to us. And I talked about the rifleman's creed being a part of being a Marine. And I want to do a little review on that. This is, this, is, this is part of the core of being a Marine. God's word is like our rifle. It's like our sword. We must master it. We're useless without it. We need to aim correctly at the enemy. And who's the enemy? Satan. Paul writes in Ephesians 6, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. We need to use God's word to hit the target, not shoot wildly in the air. I want to play it one more time. And, and as they're talking about the rifle, you think about it as your Bible. I just love that. That's your Bible. Be careful, though, how you use your sword. 
Because that's, that's, that's one of the big lessons through this with Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar. Be careful how you use your weapon. Proverbs 12, 18 says, There is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. You know, we talk about the Bible being the sword of the Spirit, but sometimes it ought to be more like a scalpel, something that brings healing rather than chopping people's heads off. And again, there's times to confront people, absolutely, absolutely. Just want to be careful how we do it. Let's stand and pray. And so, Father, as we work our way through this treasure of a book, would you refine us? Would you refine us in our roles as friends? <coughs> Help us, Lord, when we see others that are struggling. Teach us empathy. May you give us words to bring healing. Help us to be quick, uh, uh, slow. Help us to be slow, Lord, at thinking we have all the answers. You're the one ultimately who does. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless you.